Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, everyone. Hare Krishna. Bhakti Sangha Jepa conference call. Happy Shivaratri to everyone. Today on this special day, an auspicious festival of Shivaratri, we have a, His Grace Amarinda Prabhu to enlighten us on the topic of glories of Lord Shiva. Hare Krishna Amarinda Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for joining and giving your valuable time and association this morning. We are very fortunate to have you on the call. Please take over the call, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Mataji. Uh, will there be um, welcoming the devotees and we have class after that or we get started immediately? We get started. Prabhu. We'll get started. Okay. Gurave Gaura Chandra, Iradhika, Tadalaya, Krishnaya, Krishna Bhaktaya, Tad Bhaktaya, Namo Namaha, Om Ajnana Timirandhasya, Jnana Anjana Shalakaya, Chakshurun Nilitam Yena Tasmai, Shri Gurave Namaha, Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Hakadama Hiam Dadati Swa Padantikam Bandeham Shri Guroho Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhano Sute Devi Pranamami Haripri Vanchakal Pataru Pyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bhya Vaishnavi Bhya Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Namo Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shamate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Nityanamani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Prasharani Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschati Deshatarani Mukam Karuti Vachalam Pangum Langhayate Girim Yat Kripata Mahamandeshi Gurum Dinataranam Paraman and the Madhavam Krishna Chaitanya Ishwaram Vrindavana Vanipate Jayasoma Soma Mole Sanandana Sanatana Nara Detia Gopi Shwara Braja Vilasi Yugangri Padme Prema Prayachani Rupadi Namo Namaste Shankar Bhagavan ki jai, Shambhu Mahadev ki jai, Shivratri Mahamahotsav ki jai. Today is a very, very auspicious day to all the Gaudiya Vaishnavas around the world. Uh, this is a very special day because the dearest servant of Radha and Krishna, um, Gopeshwar Mahadev, Lord Shiva, is being celebrated, his lotus feet is being worshipped today around the world as the Shivratri Utsav. In fact, in the um, in the Hari Bhakti Vilas, Srila Sanatan Goswami Pad has said that all Vaishnavas, and very specifically for all of us as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, the followers of the six Goswamis, it is of uh, paramount importance to observe this day of Shivaratri and hear the glories of Lord Shiva. It's very, very important to hear about the Supreme Lord who is uh, the greatest um, fortune. Vayam hi dhanya tamalo ke kuropi kshatra bandhava vayam piba muhutvatta punyam krishna kathamritam. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, in Canto 10, Chapter 12, especially the section of the Aghasur Leela, where the very big serpent, not Kaliya, but Aghasur, uh, was delivered by Krishna. So we can see in that section, uh, Maharaj Parikshit, the primary listener of Srimad Bhagavatam, he offers his gratitude to Shukadev Goswami. And he says, Vayam hi dhanya tama loke. In this world, I consider ourselves, starting with myself, Parikshit Maharaj is speaking on behalf of all the personalities on the assembly who are listening on the banks of the Ganga to Harikatha. Maharaj Parikshit mentions, Vayam hi dhanya tamaloke. In this world, we consider ourselves to be the most fortunate. You see, there is dhanya, dhanya tara, and dhanya tama. Just like in English, we have. We have a simple sentence, then we have a comparative sentence, then we have the superlative sense, right? We have good, better, and best. So similarly, there is dhanya, dhanya tara, and dhanya tama, which means fortune, more fortunate, 
and most fortunate. So what does the word dhanyatama mean? Means most fortunate. In the superlative sense has been used. So Maharaj Parikshit mentions that I consider myself to be most fortunate. And please note when the 10th canto was spoken, it is about the fifth day out of the seven days that Maharaj Parikshit has in his life. He was cursed by the son of Shamik Rishi to die in seven days by a snake bite. The snake Takshak would, uh, would be the cause of Maharaj Parikshit's departure. So Shringi cursed Maharaj Parikshit. And out of the last seven days that he has, there are about four days already done. And he is in the fifth day hearing the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, so he has only two more days, which means let's say if it's Friday, then by the end of Sunday, uh, it's time to depart. So we, at least talking about myself, if I have to die on Sunday, and if you ask me how I feel on Friday, <laughs> I won't say, thank God, it's Friday. I will say, oh God, it's Friday, right? As people in the outside world, they say, oh God, it's Monday. And thank God, it's Friday, right? But if let's say I have to die on Sunday, I will say, oh God, it's already Friday. But Maharaj Parikshit, when he was asked by Shukadev Goswami, Maharaj Parikshit mentions, Vayam hi loke. he doesn't say I am fortunate or more fortunate. He says, I consider myself to be most fortunate. Why? Vayam piba muhutvatta punyam krishna kathamritam. He mentions that the, the definition of fortune is coming in contact with a devotee. This is fortune in our life. Because we take so many lifetimes and we get married and we have babies and we have homes and we have jobs and money. And then without any purpose, without any agenda, without any goal, we are born and then we die, right? Mark Twain very famously remarked, there are two days very prominent in a man's life. One is the day when he was born. And the second, when he realizes why he was born. <laughs> so most of us celebrate the first day, which means our birthday. But by Srila Prabhupada's mercy, uh, many fortunate souls like us, we get a chance to even celebrate the second day, the day we realize why we are born. Which means the day of coming into Krishna consciousness, our first program, first contact with the devotees, etc. Right? So fortune means coming in contact with the devotees. More fortune means getting a chance to hear Hari Katha from them. This is more fortune because we can meet a devotee at a bus station or a train station. That's also fortune. But getting a chance to sit at their lotus feet and hear Hari Katha from them. Oh, this is more fortune. And most fortune is when we are on our departing bed, on our deathbed, and Vaishnavas are sitting next to us and speaking Hari Katha and singing Hari Kirtan. So Maharaj Parikshit says, out of these three, I am the most fortunate category because I'm about to leave and I get chance to associate with thousands and thousands of Vaishnavas here on the banks of the Ganga, hearing Hari Katha from Shukadev Goswami. So I am not uh, ill-fortuned, but I am actually most fortunate. So the point is, getting a chance to hear about Krishna and getting a chance to hear about pure Vaishnavas is the matter of great fortune in our life. Lord Shiva was asked by Mother Parvati of all kinds of worship, which worship is the best? And Lord Shiva mentions, Aradhananam Sarvesham Vishnu Aradhanam Param. Of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu is the highest. But Mother Parvati, in her heart, she was thinking, but I don't worship Lord Vishnu. In my heart, I worship Lord Shiva because he's my husband and he's my guru and he's Everything for me, because for a chaste woman, a, a man who is highly qualified, very devotional, very compassionate, and a, bo and a board of all good qualities, who is uh, a very fixed up devotee. If the man is like this, following the spiritual master who is bona fide, and the man is completely surrendered to the process of bhakti, and if the wife is completely chaste to the man, then both of them go back home, back to God it together. Hmm? This is perfect the success story. The woman doesn't have to do anything. Her path is very simple. Hmm? She simply has to assist the husband um, and completely lovingly 
be loyal and chaste to him. That's all. <laughs> she will get more credit by this than even independently trying to chant Japa. If she's chanting one or two lakhs every day, but uh, if she is not uh, respecting her husband, not that the husband must be like Ravan and expect that the wife too should be like Sita. No, we are talking the husband should be high class and the wife should also be first class. And if this is together, then it's perfect success story. So in the, in the case of Mother Parvati and Lord Shiva, that is true because Lord Shiva is the greatest Vaishnava and he's the greatest personality. And Mother Parvati was thinking in her heart, Oh dear Gurudev, oh dear Lord Shiva, I am asking you what kind of worship is the best and you're telling me the best worship is the worship of the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. But in her heart, she, was, she didn't ask, but in her heart she was thinking, but I don't worship Lord Vishnu. I just worship you. So what about that? And Lord Shiva, understanding the heart of Mother Parvati, completed the verse with the next two lines. He said, Tasmat Parataram Devi Tadiyanam Samarchanam. Oh Devi, the highest worship is the worship of Vishnu. But however, greater than the worship of Vishnu is the worship of the pure Vaishnavas. So he doesn't say my <laughs> worship, but he hints that greater than the worship of the Supreme Lord is the worship of his pure representative. So Mother Parvati got the answer in her heart. Hmm? So similarly, today being Shivaratri, the most auspicious occasion of uh, worship of the lotus feet of Mother Parvati and Lord Shiva, all of us as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we get a chance to congregate together and hear Harikatha. But Harikatha in connection to Harakatha. There are two words. <laughs> Hari is Krishna, is Vishnu. Sri Ram is called Hari. Nashingadev is called Narahari. But Hara is the name for Mahadev, Lord Shiva. Why? Because Hari and Hara both come from the same root to take away. What do they take away? Uh, Vishnu takes away or Krishna takes away our heart. Hari Shabdha Nana Artha Dui Mukhyatam Sarva Amangala Hare Prem Diye Hare Man. Our Shachinandan Gaur Hari has given everything. <laughs> Whenever in Siddhanta or Rasavichar, there is any consideration of how to interpret, then we go to the teachings of Shachinandan Gaur Hari, Sriman Mahaprabhu. And he has taught everything. Very specifically in the in the section of Chaitanya Charitamrit, where Sriman Mahaprabhu has given 61 meanings, elaborations on the Atma Ramas Chamunayo verse. There the last line goes, Ittam Bhuta Guno Hari. So elaborating on the word Hari, in that context, Sriman Mahaprabhu, he says that the word Hari has many meanings, Nana Artha, but two prominent meanings. One is, he who takes away everything inauspicious, and the second is he who takes away our heart in loving service. That is Krishna. So what does Lord Shiva take away as Hara? Oh, he takes away all the obstacles on the path of a Vaishnava to bring us close to the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. So therefore, if there is someone who claims to be a Vaishnava, a devotee of Krishna, and if they displease Lord Shiva, and worst, if they neglect Lord Shiva, and if they criticize and blaspheme Lord Shiva, forget it. We are not going anywhere with this. We are not going anywhere with this. Hmm? But on the other hand, if we want to be a very good Gaudiya Vaishnava, if we want to be a very good servant of Krishna, then we should take shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Shiva and pray to him that, oh, Hara, oh, Shambhu Mahadev, oh, Gopeshwar Mahadev, oh, Sadashiva, whatever obstacles are there on my path, in attaining the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna, you please kindly take it away so that I can reach my goal very quickly. Some, somebody can ask this question. Why so much stress is given on Lord Shiva? Why not anyone else? Right? <laughs> Why is it that we should pray to Lord Shiva very specifically? Because there is, according to Siddhanta, there is a very deep meaning why. <laughs> this world is called Bhavasagara. The ocean of material existence, right? Many times we may have heard this word. Bhava Sagara, Bhava Sindhu, Bhava Abdi, Abdi, Sindhu, Sagara. They all means ocean. And Bhava means material creation, right? 
The word bhava in Sanskrit has a very specific meaning. We may have heard this word before. Chiranjivi bhava, saubhagyavati bhava, which means to become. And this world is called the world of becoming because nothing is constant. You become born, you become old, then you become diseased and you become dead and then you become reincarnated. There's constant change. The only thing that is constant is change. And the uh, word bhava means to become. Because we are, the bodies are constantly changing and becoming something or the other, this world is called the ocean of becoming, right? Bhava Sagar. <laughs> but apart from this, the word bhava is actually the name of Lord Shiva. The word bhava is actually a name for Lord Shiva. And because this world is under the protection and care of Shiva and Mother Parvati, they are the parents. Many times we may have heard that Mother Parvati, Durga Devi, Katyani Devi, Kali, Chandi, Bhadra Kali, all these forms of Mother Parvati are called as Amba, which means mother, Mata. You've heard this term? Like she is our mother. Why? Because she is the pra Prakriti. She is the material nature. And all of us are children. And so if she is the mother, who is the father? Lord Shiva is the father. So Lord Shiva is the father. And because we live in the house of the father, the house is named after the father. So this is called Bhava Sagar. <laughs> this is the ocean belonging to the father. That is Lord Shiva. And because he is Bhava, Mother Parvati as the wife of Bhava is called Bhavani. We may have heard this word. Mother Parvati is called Bhavani. Gatistvam, gatistvam, tomeka bhavani. We may have heard this very famous uh, set of prayers glorifying Mother Parvati. So she's called Bhavani. Why? Because she's the wife of Lord Shiva and he's called Bhava. Now, please note, we are trying to answer this question as to why special importance or significance of Lord Shiva is there in our life. In a conditioned state or in a liberated state, we are very, very closely connected to Lord Shiva. We mentioned reason number one, because we are all children, right? We are all, there is um, Ishwara, then there is Maheshwara, then there is Parameshwara, and then there is Sarveshwara. I will repeat. <laughs> there is Ishwara, then there is Maheshwara, and then there is Parameshwara, and then there is Sarveshwara, right? So what does this mean? All the demigods are Ishwara. They're all controllers. But greater than them, the greatest among them is Maheshwara. Mahan Ishwara iti Maheshwara, right? He is, Maheshwara means he's Mahan Ishwara. He's the greatest controller. So all the demigods are Ishwara. Lord Indra and Brahma and um, Varuna, everyone. Vayu, Agni. They're all Ishwaras. They're all controllers. They're, they control the Panchamahabhuta, the earth, water, fire, air, ether, elements. Prithvi, Jal, Akash, they, all, this, all these elements that we see are, are controlled by the demigods. So they are Ishwara. But greater than them is Maheshwara, Lord Shiva. And greater than him is Vishnu, who's called Parameshwara, as the super soul in everyone's heart. And the root of all creation Yadavanam Shiro Ratnam Krishnastu Bhagavan Swayam. Oh, he who is the root of all the fruits that we see here in this world, that is Krishna. Ete Cham Sakalapum Sam Krishnastu Bhagavan Swayam. So, if all the demigods are Ishwara, Lord Shiva is Maheshwara, and Vishnu is Parameshwara, and Krishna in Vrindavan, he who cries under the shakat because he's hungry and thirsty, oh, he's Sarveshwara, he's the root of everything. The son of Mother Yashoda, uh, the, the Lord of Srimati Radharani, Gopinath, Rathanath, Brajanath, Brindavan Chandra Shri Krishna, Rasaraj Shamsundar is the root of everything. So he's Sarveshwara. So we are trying to answer this question that why there is specific significance of Lord Shiva in our life. So reason number one we mentioned, because we live in this material world and the, the controller of this jail-like material world is Durga. And so, there's, there, so therefore, she's the mother and Lord Shiva is the father. So we are children and he's our father and therefore there's uh, direct uh, connection. But apart from that, 
there is a very subtle connection that each one of us have with Lord Shiva. Am I going too fast? Is everyone understanding? Yes, Prabhuji. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because I, I, I am coming here for service. I don't want to confuse. <laughs> so please, please note something very subtle. The connection that all of us have with Lord Shiva. <clears throat> why are all of us bound in this material world? Why is, why, why, why is the situation such that we are all bound in this material world? There is a very specific reason. Krishna bhuli jeev se anadi bahirmuk. Atha eva maya tar diya samsara duk. That as soon as we turn our face away from Krishna, janasya krishnat vimukhasya daivat adharma shila su dukhitasya anugraha eha charanti nunam bhutani bhavyani janardhanasya. Canto 3, chapter 5, Bhagavad. Apart from that, um, Krishna bhuliya jeev bhogabancha kare nikatastha maya tar japati adhare chaitanya charitam. As soon as we forget Krishna, we turn our face away from Krishna. What happens? Maya holds us. And when Maya holds us, we are given a covering called false ego. And that false ego keeps us in this world. Nothing else. It's only false ego that keeps us in this world. Now, what mode is false ego in? Is it goodness? Is it Sattvagun? Is it Rajogun? Or is it Tamogun? It is Tamogun. False ego to think that I am better than others, to think that I am actually the source of all intelligence, to think that I am the object of everyone's respect, to think that I am greater than everyone else is faulty. Till the time this is there in the heart, we are going to be here. Our stay in this material world is permanent residence. We have passport or false ego. We can live here for as long as we want. Our visa will never expire. Right, so it's the visa, the visa of false ego, which keeps us in this world, permanent residency. So, how do we understand this? You see, because the mode of ignorance is the controlling manner, because it's a, a false ego that's keeping us in this world, and false ego is a symptom of mode of ignorance. Right, so it's actually mode of ignorance which is the cause of keeping us in this world. Hmm? Who is the lord of mode of ignorance? Oh, it is Lord Shiva. So what actually is happening that when someone turns their face away from Krishna, it is Lord Shiva who goes and embraces that person. It is Lord Shiva who goes and covers that person because Lord Shiva thinks, I want to bring this Jiva back to Krishna. If he turns his face away from Krishna, he will be in illusion. He will suffer. And Lord Shiva immediately goes and embraces that person. Lord Shiva covers that person automatically. Now, because Lord Shiva is the predominating Adishthatri Dev, the worshipable deity for the mode of ignorance, and the symptom of mode of ignorance is false ego, as soon as one turns their face away from Krishna and they're covered by Lord Shiva's mercy, the person is covered with false ego. And Lord Shiva, because Mother Parvati is his wife, he naturally loves her company. <laughs> Lord Shiva enjoys Mother Parvati's company. So when someone is covered by false ego, they get that same desire of enjoying this material world. Because that's the nature of false ego. <laughs> and because false ego is in the mode of ignorance, and that is under the department of Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva's quality is to enjoy this world because he is naturally the husband, he is the lord of Prakriti. But we are not. So when we get covered by false ego, we start thinking, I want to lord over this world. All of this is meant for my enjoyment. All of this is meant for my fulfillment, for my satisfaction. But because we are not Lord Shiva, we get frustrated because that's not our position. So false ego keeps us in this world for lifetimes after lifetimes so that we get the kicks of this world and we finally turn our face towards Krishna. Now, when we turn our face towards Krishna and we start performing bhakti, Lord Shiva thinks mission successful. The person who had turned his face away from Krishna now he is turning his face towards Krishna. So actually what happens? Since the mission is about to be completed, Lord Shiva withdraws the mode of ignorance away. And as the, cover, as the mode of ignorance is withdrawn, the, the um, uh, false ego slowly starts getting dissolved and the person becomes humble. 
And when the person becomes humble on the path of bhakti after turning to Krishna, he no longer desires to enjoy this world because that influence, that covering of false ego is taken away. <laughs> so this is how closely we are connected. All of us are connected to Lord Shiva because as soon as we turn away from Krishna, it is Lord Shiva who out of his causeless mercy covers us with false ego. And then we develop the desire to enjoy this world. Again, Lord Shiva does this so that in Hindi, there is a saying, Lato ke bhut, bato se nahi mante. So much can be said to the living entity. Don't leave Krishna. Don't turn away from Krishna. But if the living entity wants to enjoy this world and turn away from Krishna, then Lord Shiva will give some punishment. So through false ego and giving us repeated troubles in this world, when we finally get frustrated that apart from Krishna, I have no other destination, Lord Shiva says, wonderful. Now you turn your face towards him. The living entity turns towards Krishna. As he turns, Lord Shiva withdraws the mode of ignorance. As he withdraws the mode of ignorance, the covering of false ego dissolves. The natural, swayameva spuratya, the natural quality of the soul to be humbled, to serve the Vaishnavas, to serve Krishna manifests. And to the extent that manifests, the desire to enjoy and control this world is gone. <laughs> and therefore, by the mercy of Lord Shiva, every conditioned soul turns towards the lotus feet of Krishna. Not because of any other kripa, only by the mercy of Lord Shiva. Only by the mercy of Lord Shiva can we turn towards Krishna. How wonderful is this? Right? Did everyone understand? The primary understanding that we are the children and Lord Shiva is our father. We are in the Bhavasa, Bhavasagara, the ocean of this material world, which belongs to Lord Shiva. That's one as a collective reason why we worship Lord Shiva. But individual reason, each one of us, we turn towards Krishna only by the mercy of Lord Shiva. When he showers mercy, everything is possible. <laughs> so this is the introduction. Now we will get started in our discussion. Uh, welcoming the occasion of Shivaratri in our heart. This is very, very important. We can see in the Padma Puran, <clears throat> uh, Sanat Kumar, one of the four Kumaras, hmm? Sanak, Sanatan, Sanat Kumar, and Sadananda. These are the four Kumaras. So uh, the four Kumaras together are called Chatush Kumar. Hmm? Sometimes they're also just called Sanaka Sanatana, hmm? like that. So Sanat Kumar, out of the four, uh, in the Padma Puran, he describes the 10 offenses to the holy name. What we chant every day, one, to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives for propagating the holy name of the Lord, etc. Um, that's actually the English to the Sanskrit, which is found in the section, in, in, a, in a specific uh, section of the Padma Puran, where the Sanskrit for the 10 offenses, Dasanama Apra, Dasanama Apra is described. So in that, the second Namapara, the second offense to the holy name, is worth noting in this regard with respect to Lord Shiva. So I request everyone, uh, at least those who are uh, uh, my friends, uh, uh, to be very, very attentive now. We are entering a zone of complete, attentive, focused, concentrated, um, dedicated hearing. The second offense to the holy name in Sanskrit is chanted as Shivasya Shri Vishnor Ya Iha Guna Namadi Sakalam Dhya Bhinnam Pashyet Sakalu Hari Nama Hitakara. Shivasya Shri Vishnor Ya Iha Guna Namadi Sakalam Dhya Bhinnam Pashyet Sakalu Hari Nama Hitakara. This is the Sanskrit for the second offense. What does it mean? We'll go word by word. Shivasya, which means Lord Shiva, and Sri Vishnoho and Lord Vishnu. Ya iha guna nama adi sakalam. With respect to both Lord Shiva's and uh, Lord uh, Vishnu's guna, qualities, nam, name, form, etc., which means their names, forms, qualities, pastimes, abode, etc. About all of them, sakalam, dhya, with our uh, intelligence. Pinnam Pashyet. If we see them to be different, if you see Lord Shiva and Vishnu to be different, Sakhalu Harinama Ahitakara, then such a person is certainly an offender. Now, this seems to be exactly opposite of what we have heard. We have always heard if you see them as same, 
then it is an offense. But you're saying if you see them different, then it is an offense. Well, both of them are true. How do we understand? Shivasya Shri Vishnu, Shiva and Lord Vishnu, Ya Iha Guna Namadi Sakalam, with respect to their name, form, qualities, pastime, etc., Dhiya Bhinnam Pashir. Now, focus on this word Dhiya Bhinnam, which means Dhiya with one's intelligence and buddhi, Bhinnam. If you see them different, Pashir, then it is an offense. But at the same time, if you break it differently, Dhiya Bhinnam can be understood as Dhiya plus Bhinnam, which means if you see them different, Bhinna, then it is an offense. Or it can also break as Dhiya plus Abhinnam, which means to not see them separate, which means to see them the same. If you see them as separate, then it is an offense. Or, and, and if you see them same, then it is an offense. So this is the complete understanding of the second offense. Shivasya Shri Vishnoho Ya Iha Guna Namadi Sakalam Dhiya Bhinnam Pashyet, which means Dhiya Bhinnam, seeing them different, or Dhiya Abhinnam, to see them same. Pashyet, if you see, Sir Khalu, then indeed that person, Harinam Ahitakara, he is, he is performing or he's committing an offense at the lotus feet of Harinam. Which means if you see them different, if you see Vishnu and Shiva to be different, it is an offense. And if you see them same, oh, then also it is an offense. Then what should we do? Should we see them as same or should we see them as different? This is why in the English, very beautifully it is translated, um, um, after the Vaishnava Parad, to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their life for propagating the holy name of the Lord as the first offense. Second is to consider the names of demigods like Lord Shiva or Brahma to be equal or independent or different. Then it is an offense. So very beautifully in the English, it has been reconciled. Srila Sanatan Goswami to save all of us from this Nama Parad because there will be people who will think that they are the same and that's an offense. And there will be people who think that they are different. And that's a Nama Parath. And with Nama Parath, Bahu Janma Kari Yadi Shravana Kirtan Tabutana Paya Krishna Pade Prematha. We can perform a Nama Parath for lifetimes, but we will not go anywhere with that. So to protect all of us from this Nama Parath, Srila Sanatan Goswami in the Hari Bhakti Vilas, he has mentioned as a rule that Vaishnava should observe Shivaratri and hear the glories of Lord Shiva that day. Shiva Tattva is actually very, very complicated Tattva. Very complicated. Some say he's Vishnu and some say he's not Vishnu. Some say he's the best Vaishnav. Some say he's a demigod. Uh, some say he is in the role of destruction, Tandam Nritya. Some say he's the creator. How do we understand? It's a very, very complicated, very complex uh, Tattva of all the Tattvas, of all the philosophical truths, the identity of Lord Shiva. It's very difficult to understand. But today we will try to hear with a very open heart. I know the pastimes of the Lord are very uh, tasty and very easy to absorb. We will come to that. But uh, for a few minutes, we will hear some Tattva Siddhanta. Because there is so much confusion in the Vaishnava community about the identity of Lord Shiva. So without establishing very firmly, Siddhanta Baliya Chitte Nakar Alas. So skipping the identity of the personality, skipping the, uh, the complexity in the Tattva Siddhanta, how can we completely and uh, truly relish the pastime? So for a few minutes, we will hear some Siddhanta. And then after that, we'll have some Leela Katha. <clears throat> Please note, first and foremost, Lord Shiva in his highest manifestation, in his first manifestation, in his most divine, transcendental, spiritual manifestation, he is called Sadashiva. This is the first level of Shiva Tattva, the, the highest manifestation in the spiritual world. He is called Sadashiva. He has his planet way beyond the material sky, beyond the material world. And he is worshipped there eternally by his loving associates. Those who worship him as Sadashiva, they know him to be Vishnu Tattva. He is eternal. He is non-different from Vishnu. They see him as Bhagavan. And naturally, those who worship Shiva as Sadashiva, as the direct manifestation of Vishnu Tattva, and see him as Bhagavan, what do they do whenever they come to any Shiva Linga in this world? They will see him as non-different from Vishnu, as Sadashiva. And they will also see the Shaivites as Vaishnavas. 
because Vishnu and they are seeing uh, Lord Shiva as Vishnu Tattva, then naturally the followers of Sadashiva, Shaivates, uh, they will see them, uh, the, the Vaishnavas will see the Shaivates also uh, in this vichar, in this drishtikon, in this vision, they will see them also as Vaishnavas. All of the Srila Sanatana Goswami has defined very wonderfully in Hari Bhakti Vilas. So, <clears throat> Sadashiva is Vishnu Tattva. This must be clear. He is the eternal manifestation of the Lord. In the, he, he has a planet of his own, the spiritual world. And it is this Sadashiva who appears as Advaita Acharya in Gauralila. He's called Advaita Acharya. Acharya because he's teaching by personal example. And he's called Advaita because he's non different from Mahaprabhu. He's Prabhu and Mahaprabhu is Mahaprabhu. Uh, but they're non different. Advaita. Hmm? He's, he's completely non different. Sadashiva, just like he's Vishnu, similarly Advaita Acharya, completely non different from Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm? So if you see this Sadashiva to be different from Vishnu, then it is Namaprat. This should be understood because he is eternal and he is Vishnu Tattva. If you see them separate, if you see this Sadashiva to be different from Vishnu in any way, oh, then it is Namaprat. It is like saying that I respect uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but I don't consider Advaita Acharya to be as great as Mahaprabhu. Because he's the cause of the appearance of Mahaprabhu. So as far as Sadashiva is concerned, if you see them uh, different than Vishnu, then it is Namaprat. This expansion um, of Sadashiva is also a very great devotee. He teaches bhakti. He's, uh, he teaches bhakti uh, to Krishna. And Krishna is the origin of all shaktis and all Aishwarya. So therefore, the Sadashiva, he should not be seen in any way um, to be different. But at the same time, we should understand that there is difference. What is that difference? Krishna is the source of all Aishwarya. He's the source of all inconceivable qualities. He's the source of all Madhurya. And Sadashiva, although he is non-different from the Supreme Lord, he can be seen equal in, in all respects. Srila Jiva Goswami explains this very specifically in the Bhakti Sandarbha. And I want to come and bring our attention back to the second Nama Parad. Srila Jiva Goswami points out Shivasya Sri Vishnu Ya Ihan Guna Nama Adi Sakalam. We have chanted this verse before, uh, the second Nama Parad. Srila Jiva Goswami, very specifically in the Bhakti Sandarbha, he points out that if you hear carefully, the honorific title of Sri is given for Vishnu, but not for Lord Shiva. The verse goes as Shivasya Sri Vishnu, which means the word Sri is going for Vishnu as the honorific title. Because if it was meant for, if they were equal in all respects, then it will be Shri Shivasya, Shri Vishnu, or it will just be Shivasya Vishnu Cha, a Shiva and Vishnu, without honorific titles to either or to both if they're equal. But we can see that uh, there is a specific difference pointed out. Shivasya, Shri Vishnu. The honorific title Shri is given to Vishnu, but not to Shiva. The Srila Jiva Goswami has pointed out. Also, we can see that in the Vishnu Sahasranam, when Lord Shiva is being invoked as the speaker, the word used is Shri Ishwara Uvacha. And when Krishna speaks, then the word used is Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. So the difference in titles of Ishwara and Bhagavan has also been maintained uh, throughout the Vishnu Sahasranam, which was actually spoken by Bhishma Dev uh, to Yudhishthir Maharaj. This has been compiled in the, uh, by, by Veda Vyas himself. So that honorific honorific difference is seen not just by Jiva Goswami in Bhakti Sandarbha to Padma Puran of, Sana, of uh, Sanat Kumar that Shiva Sri Vishnu, they are giving a difference in the honorific title, but even Bhishma Dev is using the word Ishwara and Bhagavan. So we must understand that Sadashiva, the first level of Shiva Tattva, he is uh, Vishnu Tattva only. He is Vishnu Tattva. <clears throat> he is eternal Lord. He is Bhagavan. But yet at the same time, just like Krishna is the source of everything, He's the, um, Krishna is the origin for all Aishwarya and all Madhurya. We cannot say that Sadashiva is the same. So therefore, we could say that he is equal, but yet at the same time, there is difference. So this is the first level of Shiva Tattva. Now let's move to the second level of Shiva Tattva. This, this manifestation is called Shambhu. The first manifestation is called Sadashiva. The second manifestation is called Shambhu. As far as Shambhu is concerned, the definition goes straight into the Brahma Samhita. Um, 
our uh, beloved Param Pujapad Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj was so attached to uh, Brahma Samhita. Yesterday I was hearing from one devotee that uh, Srila Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj used to uh, inspire the devotees to chant the Brahma Samhita. And in fact, even take initiation vows that I would chant 16 rounds every day, 25 rounds on Ekadashi, and also I will recite the Brahma Samhita. So, and Maharaj has given series of classes also on the Brahma Samhita. The Brahma Samhita is a very important text. Our uh, Prabhupada Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur has commented on the verses of the Brahma Samhita, the fifth chapter of the Brahma Samhita. So in the Brahma Samhita, the very famous verse, Kshiram yatha dadi vikara vishesha yogat sanjayate nahitata prakatasti heto yahasham bhutam apitata samupaiti karyat govindamadi purusham tamaham bhajam. So in this verse, Lord Brahma himself is speaking the identity of Shambhu. Now this is the second level of Shiva Tattva. He explains that Kshiram yatha dadhi vikara vishesha yoga. Just like milk, uh, when it comes in touch with a curdling agent, automatically milk becomes yogurt. But similarly, Govinda, uh, Krishna, for manifesting this material world, has come in contact with this material world as Shambhu. So Shambhu is not equal to Vishnu Tattva. Hmm? This we must understand. Srila Jiva Goswami has commented on the Brahma Samhita. And in this section, Srila Jiva Goswami explains the example of milk and yogurt is significant, but it has boundaries. We must understand. The significance is milk can become yogurt, but yogurt cannot become milk. Srila Jiva Goswami explains this. He explains that similarly, Vishnu or Govinda can uh, manifest the form of Shambhu, but in no way can Shambhu become Govinda in Brinda. This must be understood. Also, just like uh, milk on being curdled becomes yogurt. So it's not that uh, there is some transformation of Govinda from one to become Shambhu. There's no transformation. It just shows, Srila Jiva Goswami has written this in the commentary, that milk and yogurt, it must be understood that just that the yogurt is, no, milk is the source for yogurt. That is the understanding and not vice versa. So similarly, this verse or this analogy or this metaphorical explanation is to mention that it is Krishna or Govinda who is the source of Shambhu and not the other way. So Vishnu Tattva is that Tattva which never comes in contact with material nature or material energy. So it's actually an expansion of Vishnu who comes in contact with material energy for creation and he's called Shambhu. This is the specific understanding. So it's an it's a, it's a expansion of Vishnu, we can say. He's not Vishnu Tattva, but he's an expansion specifically to come in contact with material energy for the purpose of creation. This is very important. Actually, Srila Jiva Goswami has commented many technical details in this regard as to what the Vikara Vishesh is all about. Uh, he has explained, but in the um, interest of time and also to reduce the complexity, we will not talk about the four energies and the four aspects of Vikar Vishesh <laughs> that Srila Jiva Goswami has very beautifully described. So we can explain Shambhu Tattva, the second level of Vishnu Tattva with an example. We can understand Krishna or Vishnu to be a power generator. Hmm? And all the jivas in the body of Mahavishnu, we can consider them, them to be an electric current. So from the power generator called Vishnu, the jivas in the form of the electric current are manifesting. But the power generator cannot directly come in touch with the, uh, the different devices or let's say the electric bulbs that we have at home. Right. So the elect. So first, let's put the pieces of the 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 example together. The power generator in our example is compared. To, uh, Vishnu is compared to the power generator. The jivas in the body of Vishnu are compared to the electric current. The electric bulbs that we see are connected to prakriti or material nature. So just like a power generator cannot directly, you can't just bring him next to an electric bulb. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. The electric current must flow through copper wires. And that's how the electric bulbs will be lit. So similarly, the creation takes place in a very beautiful way. Vishnu as the powerhouse of all electricity, or let's say in this case, as the powerhouse, who's having the electric current called as jivas, gives the jivas to the copper wire manifestation called a Shambhu, who carries the glands of Vishnu in the form of, and all the jivas in that glands and gives it to Prakriti or material nature, 
who is the electric bulb. So the electric bulb connect gets the electricity through the wires. So basically it is Prakriti Devi or Parvati Devi or Durga Devi who gets all the jivas impregnated in her womb of this material world through the copper wires called Shambhu, who is the intermedium connecting Prakriti and Vishnu. So Vishnu is the power generator, powerhouse, and Prakriti is the electric bulb. And the electric current of the jivas is going through the copper wire called Shambhu. So this example or this analogy could be given. So let's say uh, we, we see a Shiva Linga in this world. What are people worshipping? People are worshipping a Linga. They are, they are worshipping the Shambhu manifestation, the second manifestation, because he is the cause of the creation of this world. So everyone goes to a Shiva Linga and they are worshipping Shambhu. They are actually anyone and everyone, if you see, they're going to a Shiva Linga, they're worshipping that manifestation of Shiva uh, who has created this world. That is why a Linga is being worshipped, right? This is important to note. So they are worshipping Shambhu as the creator of this world. Now, if you consider this Shambhu to be equal to Vishnu, the source of everything, oh, that is also Namapara. Understand? So this is how the context of Shiva Sya Shri Vishnu Ho Ya Iha Guna Namadi Sakalam Dhyya Bhinnam Pashyet so kalu harinama ahitakara so in this way if you see sadashiva gopeshwar mahadev to be different than vishnu then it is an offense and if you see the second manifestation shambhu to be equal to vishnu because he's an expansion if you see him equal well, then it is an offense so this is why it is important to note that the difference consideration is for sadashiva so he is actually vishnu tattva and if you see him different then it is an offense and the oneness consideration is for Shambhu, the second manifestation, because he's an expansion. And if you see him one with Vishnu, uh, then it is an offense. Therefore, Dhyā Bhinnam Pashyat, the verse has very beautifully said Dhyā Bhinnam and Dhyā Abhinnam Pashyat, considering Sadashiva and also Shambhu. <laughs> so this, this could be understood. So now the question could be, when we go to a temple and we see a Shiva Linga, are we seeing Sadashiva or are we seeing Shambhu? How should we worship? Oh, it completely depends on the bhav of the devotee. Completely depends on the bhav of the devotee. If you worship him as Sadashiva, as the eternal Lord, then he will bless you like Gopeshwar Mahadev. He will bless you. As we have bhav, yadrishi, bhavana yasya siddhir bhavati tadrishi. The word says that depending on how you see Lord Shiva, he will reciprocate. I'll give you a parallel example. Let's say you see Tulsi Devi in this world. Tulsi Devi. If you see her as a plant, well, then she will just be a plant for you. If you see her as a herb and you use Tulsi leaves for medical purposes, well, then all that she will do for you is cure diseases. That's all. And if you see her as, oh, she's Tulsi, married to Shaligran Shila, then what will happen? Oh, she will take you to Vaikuntha. Because she is called Tulsi as uh, the consort of Shaligram in Vaikuntha, not in Golok. <laughs> the name Tulsi comes from Vaikuntha up to this material world. But in Golok of Vrindavan, she is Sakhi. She is called Brinda Devi. So if you see her as the, the forest goddess of Braj, who brings in the meeting of Radha and Krishna, and that Brinda Devi has manifested in the form of a plant so that we can get Braja Prapti, the attainment of the mood of Braj. Then that same Tulsi Devi will give you the abode of Vrindavan. Is this clear? Gange, Champe, Tadid, Vinindi, Roshi, Pravahas, Navitatma, Vrinde, Bandhu, Kabandhu, Dyutiti, Vyavaso, Vrinde, Namaste, Charanaravinda. So as uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we see Tulsi Devi. We, we respect her, of course, as the the consort of Shaligram, but that's Vaikuntha Bhav. For those who want to enter Braj Bhav, we have to see Brinda Devi as uh, uh, Tulsi Devi as Brinda Devi, as the Adhishthatri Dev, as the predominating presiding deity of Brindavan. She's the queen of Brindavan. She's very, very dear to Radha and Krishna. So we pray. Therefore, you see how wonderfully Srila Prabhupada transcendently dragged us to this conception without telling us all of this tattva. <laughs> he has given, Srila Prabhupada has given this. Why? 
Because what are we praying in the Tulsi Arati? Namo Nama Tulasi Krishna Prayasi Namo Namo Namaha Radha Krishna Seva Pabo A Abhilashi. It is not Lakshmi Narayan Seva Pabo A Abhilashi. It is Radha Krishna Seva Pabo A Abhilashi, which means we are praying to Brinda Devi. Radha Krishna Seva. I want the service of Radha Krishna. Je Tumar Sharana Loy Tara Bancha Purna Hoy Kripa Kori Koro Tare Shri Vaikuntha Vasi Brindavana Vasi. <laughs> So we pray to Tulsi Devi as Brinda Devi, that you are the forest goddess of Brindavan. So please take me to the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. And even in the last, the whole song can be discussed, but the last line also says, Shri Radha Govinda Preme Sada Jenavhasi. I want to just swim and float in the waves of ecstasy in the oceanic love of Shri Shri Radha Govinda. And this is why we are praying to Tulsi Devi, because she's the plant manifestation of the forest goddess, Brinda. So therefore, if you take the dust uh, at, the, at the root of a Tulsi plant, this is equaling Brajraj, the dust of Brindavan. Because Tulsi doesn't grow anywhere outside Brindavan. And wherever she is growing, that is Brindavan. So the point where she meets the mud, her roots are there. That dust there, right there, is the dust of Braj. How wonderful. <laughs> so similarly, just like Tulsi, depending on how we approach her, either just as a plant or with medical medicinal values or as Tulsi Shalikram or as Brinda Sakhi, she will reciprocate. So similarly, when we see uh, a Shivalinga in this world, if you worship him as Gopeshwar Mahadev, as Sadashiva, the eternal resident of Brindavindha, then he will give you Vrajaprapti. He will give you the attainment of Braj. In Sankalpa Kalpadruma, Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur has sung this very beautiful prayer. Vrindavana vanipate jaya soma soma maule sanandana sanatana naradedhya gopishwara vrajavilasi yugangri padme prema prayacha nirupadi namo namaste. Srila Chakravarti Thakur is an eternal manjari, a maidservant of Radha Govinda. Why will he offer prayer to Lord Shiva? Oh, because he's praying to Sadashiva, he's praying to Gopishwar Mahadev. <laughs> he, what is he praying? Oh, Shivji. Oh, Gopeshwar Mahadev, I have only one desire in my heart. What is that? Those two lotus feet of Radharani and the two lotus feet of Krishna who are walking close to each other in the forests of Braj, performing very sweet, attractive, intoxicating pastimes. May my two feet also walk behind them in loving service. Hanatha Gokula Sudhakara Suprasanna Vaktra Ravinda Madhurasvita He Kripardra Yatra Toya Viharate Pranaya Priyarat Tatraiva Mam Apinaya Priya Sevanaya. Srila Raghunath Daskaswami has also prayed this that O Radharani, O Sri Krishna, please give me one benediction that wherever you go, you will drag me to serve you. In whichever forest you both walk, don't just walk alone, walk with me. You take me behind you so that if you need anything, I'm always there. I'm always there to offer the, the umbrella. I'm always there to spread the lotus petals and the rose petals on the floor so that your feet are walking on top of them. I'm always there creating fountains on the sides. I'm always there giving tambu, beetle uh, to eat. I am always there bringing nice, sweet beverages. I am always there to make arrangements for the swing festival and the boat festival. I am always there uh, spraying very intoxicating scents, depending on the mood of the pastime. I am always there singing songs and, and <laughs> fanning you with, uh, with affection. So similarly, Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur has prayed to Gopeshwar Mahadev that my only desire, my absolutely my only desire, is please give me love. Please give me service at the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Oh, Shambhu Maha, oh, oh Sadashiva, oh, Gopeshwar Mahadev, there's nothing else that I want. So this is the prayer we can also offer. So we finished two levels of Shiva Tattva. There's one more, and then that finished, finishes the Tattva. Then as I promised, I will speak some Leela Katha. So the third level of Shiva Tattva, uh, the third manifestation is called Rudra. We may have heard this word before, Rudra, as one of the names. There is actually a Rudram in the Vedas, glorifying Lord Shiva. So when, when the time of dissolution comes in, 11 Rudras manifest. And they perform their Tandavan Nritya 
and they destroy the whole creation. So when we when we have heard that, oh, Lord Shiva opens his third eye. Oh, Lord Shiva, he dances Tandava and the whole world gets destroyed. Oh, that's not the first. That's not Sada Shiva because he has nothing to do with this material world. He's in the spiritual world. And it's not Shambhu who's creating. Why will he destroy something that he's creating? His service is to create. It's the third manifestation of Lord Shiva. And he's called Rudra. He is in charge of the, uh, the time of dissolution and destruction. In fact, some texts describe, some scriptural texts describe that if we follow Varnashram Dharma very uh, nicely and strictly, perfectly for uh, hundreds and hundreds of lifetimes, then we can take the position of Brahma. And then the text continues that if we follow the duties of Brahma properly, then we can attain Rudratva. Please hear this attentively. Not becoming Rudra, but we can attain Rudratva, which means not to become Rudra, but to attain the qualities of Rudra. That's called Rudratva. Nija Nikata Nivasam Dehi Govardhanatva. <laughs> please give me the quality. Oh, Govardhan, please give me your qualities. <laughs> Govardhanatva. Uh, Sattva. Right? Tattva, which means, or uh, similarly, Rudratva which means not Rudra, becoming Rudra, but having the qualities of Rudra. So these 11 Rudras who are in charge of destruction, they have associates. And all of their associates, they have the qualities of Rudra. So which means if we follow Varnashram Dharma properly um, for hundreds of lifetimes, then we can become Brahma. And if we do the duties of Brahma nicely, we can attain Rudratva, which means we can become one of the associates of the 11 Rudras. And we can assist in the dance of destruction uh, and, and we can help Rudra destroy this world. Although this is possible, this is not recommended. <laughs> this is not recommended. What is recommended? Instead of dancing Tandav dance uh, uh, for Rudra, we can dance Tandav dance in the dance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is recommended. <laughs> we can dance in the dance of divinity. But however, this is a possibility. We can attain Rudratva. That's not our ambition. Our ambition is to become a servant of Lord Shiva, praying for Vaishnavatva. Vaishnavanam yatha shambhu. Bhagavatam describes Nimnaganam yatha ganga, Devanam achuto yatha, Vaishnavanam yatha shambhu, Purananam idam tatha. Of all the worshipable personalities, Krishna is the topmost. Of all the flowing rivers, Ganga is the topmost. Of all the uh, readable Shastras, revealed scriptures, Bhagavatam is the topmost. Similarly, of all Vaishnavas, uh, Lord Shiva is the topmost. So therefore, as far as Tattva Vichar, as far as philosophical conclusion is concerned, we come to the end of our discussion as far as Tattva is concerned. Now we will start Leela. So to quickly wrap up, we mentioned three terms for Shiva Tattva. We mentioned Sadashiva in the spiritual world. You mentioned Shambhu in source of, uh, in connection with creation. And we spoke about Rudra as the destroyer. So if somebody sees a Shivalinga, they can see him as Rudra. They can see him as Shambhu. They can see him as Sadashiva or Gopeshwar Mahadev. Our recommendation as Gaudiya Vaishnavas is to see him as Gopeshwar Mahadev, as Sadashiva, the eternal associate of Radha and Krishna. So now let's hear uh, some Leela Katha. Uh, Kirtida Sundari Mataji, is it okay if I go a little over time today? Yes, Prabhu, definitely. Okay, thank you, Mataji. So, please, everyone, let us dive deep into some Leela Katha now. The Leela Katha is based on the phrase Vaishnava Nam Yathasham. We will hear many short uh, aspects about Lord Shiva, which prove that he is the best among Vaishnavas. Hmm? Let's hear. So, once upon a time, Narad Muni was traveling around the world, around, in fact, the whole creation, the whole universe, searching for the best devotee. We know this from Brihad Bhagavatam. And eventually he came to Lord Shiva. And he said, oh, best devotee, oh, giver of bhukti, mukti, and bhakti. You can give material enjoyment. You can liberate somebody from material enjoyment. And you can even give them, give them bhakti. Oh, dear friend of Krishna. Oh, meditator on Sankarshan. You are certainly the best devotee in the whole of creation. Lord Shiva, he bowed down <laughs> to this proposal in embarrassment. <laughs> he said, what do you think of best devotee? Lord Shiva said, I am not even a devotee. 
I am not even a devotee. What to speak of best devotee? How did Ravana become powerful? How did he terrorize everyone and kidnap Mother Sita? Lord Shiva said, because I benedicted Ravana. I benedicted and gave so much power to Ravana that he could take Sita away from Ram and give so much pain to the heart of the Lord, Sri Ram. He was crying, Sita, Sita, Sita. Hmm? How can I even be a devotee? What to speak of best devotee? I'm not even a devotee because I am the source of all pain given to the heart of Sri Ram. Oh, Narada, I live in a crematorium. I rub ashes all over my body. I have snakes around my neck. I sit on tiger skin. I scare everyone with my trishul, my trident. And to add more trouble, all of my associates are bhuta, preta, and pishacha, which means ghosts and hobgoblins. Hmm? <laughs> Scary personalities. Please don't believe Lord Shiva. He's speaking out of humility. We will reconcile all this. But uh, he's, the nature of the Vaishnava is such that he's only seeing faults in himself. Vaishnava is like that. He will only see where I am going wrong. He has no time to hear the faults of others and the good qualities of himself. So Lord Shiva, what, what can we speak about? He's finding faults in him where there are no faults, actually. To continue, Lord Shiva then said to Narad Muni, you know, when Krishna wants to fulfill some desire or some act and no one wants to do it, uh, he sees, where is Shiva? <laughs> where is Shiva? The services that nobody wants to do because they're not good services. It's not good. <laughs> nobody, the things that nobody will do, Krishna knows, oh, Shiva will do. He gives the example. In the churning of the milk ocean, poison came out. The whole world was burning. And Vishnu is thinking now what to do. Shiva, please drink this. <laughs> and Lord Shiva, he sipped it. He sipped all the poison manifested in this cosmic creation. And he sipped it, but he sipped it in a very spe special way. He didn't swallow it down his throat and nor did he spit it out. He held it and kept it in his neck. And therefore, he's called Nila Kantha, the one with a blue throat. Or he's also sometimes called Kala Kantha, bluish black complexion throat, because he held the poison there. Actually, Lord Shiva is teaching us something very important. Very, very important. What is the most deadliest poison in this world? What is the most dangerous poison in this world? It's not cyanide. It is Vaishnav Ninda. It is the criticism of Vaishnavas. Yesterday, Param Pujipa Chila Radhanath Swami Maharaj was explaining how Ramchandra Puri, um, he uh, couldn't understand his senior god brother Ishwara Puri. He even couldn't understand the bhav of his Guru Maharaj Sri Pad Madhavendra Puri. And later he found faults even with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He saw so many ants around and he said, oh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, he's eating too much sweets. That's why these ants are here. Actually, ants are there everywhere in Jagannath Puri. Hmm. But Ramchandra Puri, he criticized so much. But Srila Radhanath Swami Maharaj very beautifully explained. He didn't get uh, afflicted with cholera or leprosy. You see the example of Amoha, he got cholera. You see the example of um, uh, Gopal Chapal, Gopal Chakravarti, all of them got uh, leprosy because they criticized Vaishnavas. But you see, that Ramchandra Puri, he did not, they, all of them had envy towards Vaishnavas. And as a result, they got these this illness in their body. But Ramchandra Puri did not get any cholera or any um, uh, leprosy. And Srila Radhanath Swami Maharaj said, why? Didn't the Lord punish him? Well, the Lord punished him with a disease way more deeper than that. And that was, he became a critical fault finder. What was the what is uh, what what actually happened is Maharaj explained that initially he was such that he would see faults where there were faults, but then as a result of finding faults with Vaishnavas, he now got the disease on a subtle platform, not the disease of the body in the form of cholera or leprosy. He got the disease of the heart, which means now he was seeing faults even in places where faults didn't exist. That's a disease. Imagine if you see the whole world red when it is not, it's, there's something wrong. Similarly, when you see faults in places where there are no faults, that's a, that's a problem. That's a disease. 
Maharaj explained, Ramchandra Puri was in, uh, afflicted with the greatest disease. And the greatest disease is to find fault with Vaishnavas. Therefore, our motto in life is Vaishnavera Gunagrahi na dekhai dosh kaya mana vakya kare Vaishnava santosh. What, is, what does this mean? Vaishnavera Gunagrahi. We should always, at all times, in all circumstances, endeavor for only one thing. I only want to collect the good qualities in others. And na dekhai dosh. We don't want to see the faults. Well, Shukdev Goswami has said, Kaler dosha nidhe rajan. This Kali Yuga is an ocean of faults. So if you start counting the faults, our whole human life will go only in counting faults where there are faults and also in places where there are no faults. So by practice, we will get good at what we practice, which means we will get good at finding faults. But we will not find Krishna. <laughs> because he is beyond false. So if you just count the false, you'll never get him. <laughs> but our motto is Vaishnavera Gunagrahi. We want to collect the good qualities. Na dekhai dosh. And we don't want to see the false. Kaya mana vakya kare Vaishnava santosh. Through words, through mind, and through activities, we only want to give pleasure to Vaishnavas. Whoever has whatever fault, let them have. We don't care. Anybody who has shampoo while they're washing their hair, you know, it's just a temporary phase. You stand under the shower, all that shampoo will go away. The hair will become clean, right? The roots of the hair will become strong. So similarly, seeing faults in Vaishnavas is like seeing shampoo on the head. By the shower water of bhakti, very soon all of them will go away. But by collecting all of that, our heart has become contaminated. So coming back to Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva, by drinking the poison, not swallowing it and not spitting it out, he has taught all of us a very deep lesson. The greatest poison in this world is not cyanide, but it is Vaishnav Ninda. Vaishnav Ninda. Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, he had a vrat. This is described in Antelila Chaitanya Charitamrit, chapter 13. Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami describes Raghunath Bhatta Goswami. He had a vrat. He had a vow. What was it? When someone comes and criticizes Vaishnavas, oh, this person is like this, that person is like that. Raghunath Bhatta Goswami used to shut his ear. And he would say, hey, stop. They are all doing Hari Bhajan except me. No criticizing. This was the breath of Raghunath Bhatt Goswami. And Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami has very beautifully described. Vaishnavera uh, ninda karma na padikane. Never will the bad activities of any Vaishnav get into his ear. Sabe Krishna Bhajan kari ei matravan. He would only consider that everyone is doing Hari Bhajan except me. This was the breath of Raghunath Bhatt Goswami. So our Shivji is teaching us that the greatest poison in this world is Vaishnav Ninda. So if we get a chance ever to drink this poison due to inconceivable bad fortune, let's say somebody just jumping the bad qualities of a Vaishnav into us. Lord Shiva is teaching us, what should we do? Yes, we drink that poison, but we don't take it inside. We don't swallow it, which means we don't accept it. We don't take it to heart. And we don't spit it out, which means we will not tell others what we heard. So you just let it pass. Understand? This is the first proof why he's Vaishnavanam Yathasham. Not just because materially he's drinking poison to save everyone, because he's teaching the whole world. First of all, no Vaishnav criticism. But if at all we ever get the, the ill fortune, the misfortune of hearing it, then we hold it in the throat. Get it in, but not to the heart, which means we don't believe it. And we don't spit it out and contaminate others. So Lord Shiva started saying, <laughs> Lord Shiva started telling that uh, this is my situation. I'm drinking poison. That thing that nobody's doing, uh, that I will do. So how am I dear? Why am I dear to the Lord? I am actually very fallen. I am, I am the worst person. Lord Shiva started saying. <laughs> then he started telling Narada Muni. So many people. Uh, they were worshipping Bhagavan, not to please him, not to please him, but to take material benefits out of him. So Vishnu started thinking that so many are worshipping my lotus feet and they're worshipping my lotus feet not to please me, but actually to gain some material benefits out. So Vishnu started thinking all of these personalities with mixed agenda who are worshipping the lotus feet of Vishnu for material benefits, they are also passed out, you know, passed off as Vaishnavas. They, people say they are also Vaishnavas. But Vishnu said, thought to himself, we should, uh, they are all mixed in the Vaishnav Sampradaya. So we must actually separate them 
and put them in a different compartment or a different sampradaya, <laughs> in a different line. So Vishnu started thinking and contemplating. I want someone to go into this material world and remove all of these people out from the Vaishnav Sampradaya and make a different Sampradaya of their own. I want someone who can go and preach a philosophy, something very different from the conclusion of the Vedas. I want someone to go and preach that Jiva, who is Anuatma, small fragment, is actually equal to Parabrahman, is equal to the Supreme Lord. This is completely against, this is bogus. This is not Vaishnav philosophy. Why is this is not Vaishnava philosophy? Because if the Jiva, Atma, is the same as Paramatma and the two become one, then whom are we serving? Which means if we, if we become Bhagavan and we become him, and if it is no two, then there is no service between the two. There is no love between the two. Then what is the meaning of being a servant? Which means saying that I am God means I am not his servant. I am the enjoyer. I don't have to serve. There is no love. Prem Tattva out of the window. You see? So to think that I am God is actually the opposite shore of Vaishnava philosophy. So Vishnu started thinking that which is the highest conclusion of the Vedas, which is Krishna Bhakti and Krishna Prem, uh, should be taken out. Uh, so that those who don't want Bhakti, they will all get filtered out. I want someone to mix this and give the philosophy that Jiva and Parabrahman are the same. But nobody wants to preach this. Everybody wants to preach the right philosophy. Everybody wants, everybody will come down as acharyas and preach the conclusion of the Vedas. He said, I want to do this service or I want someone to do this service, but no one is ready. Let me think whom to send. And Vishnu started contemplating. Shivji. <laughs> that service that nobody will do, Shivji will do. So Shivji started telling Naradhmani, what kind of servant is this? He's coming down in this world and preaching. And we all know. It was Shivji who came down as Adi Shankaracharya. And he preached uh, the Advaita Vedanta. So he's telling Narada Muni that when God, when God wants to preach the right philosophy, he sends everyone. But <laughs> he thinks of me only when the opposite things has to be done, preaching against him. So how can I be dear in any way? How can I be dear in any way? It's not possible. I cannot be dear in any way. Then Shivji continued. You know, Narad Muni, I want to tell you another thing. Jayadrat, the brother-in-law of Duryodhan. Duryodhan's uh, sister was married to Jayadrat. So Jayadrat was the husband of Duryodhan's sister. So Jayadrat was the brother-in-law for Duryodhan. So one time, <clears throat> now into the pages of the Mahabharat, the Pandavas were living in Kamvan or Kamyavan in Vrindavan. And Draupadi came to fill water on the banks of Vimalkund. And Jayadrat, although he was married, he got attracted to Draupadi. And uh, he put his chariot down and ran to Draupadi, picked her up and put her in the chariot. And he started fleeing. He started going very fast on the chariot. And that time is very related to Narad Muni because it was Narad Muni who came to that scene at that point. And he went and told the Pandavas. Especially he went and told Bhimsen <laughs> because Narad Muni knows whom to go and give what message. So Narad Muni went to Bhimsen. Bhimsen is always hungry and thirsty for battles. So Narad Muni went and told Bhim that, you know, Jayatrat, he has, um, he has abducted, kidnapped Draupadi and put onto his chariot. Bhimsen did not even get onto the chariot. He didn't even jump on the chariot. He started sprinting after Jayatrat to kill him. Arjuna also came there and with weapons, Arjuna destroyed the chariot and um, dragged Jayadrat. Jayadrat let go of Draupadi. Arjuna told Bhim, you take care of Draupadi, I will take care of Jayadrat. Bhim Sen agreed. He took care of Draupadi to protect her and Arjuna bound Jayadrat like an animal. Bound Jayadrat like an animal. And um, he got him at the lotus feet of Yudhishthir Maharaj. Now, Bhim Sen and Arjun, Draupadi, they got uh, Jayadrat to Yudhishthir Maharaj and asked Yudhishthir Maharaj, Oh brother, you please give us permission to kill him. He's a monster. You know, he was uh, lustily eyeing our wife. Bhim also wants to kill him. Arjuna said, I also want to kill him. Yudhishthir Maharaj, you please, oh dear brother, you please give us permission. Yudhishthir Maharaj said, you ask Draupadi. She was the one who's offended. So you... you 
you consult her as she was insulted. You'll see what Draupadi says. So then when they asked Draupadi, Draupadi's heart is that of the mother. So she said, no, we should not kill. Why? Because her wife, uh, Jayadrat's wife, who was like our sister, because we know Pandavas and Kauravas are brothers. So uh, the, the sister of Duryodhan, it's like the sister for Draupadi. So Draupadi said, our sister will become a widow if Jayadrat is killed. And she will cry all her life in separation from the husband. Um, so we, we should not we should not kill him. Draupadi said we should we should let Jayadrat go alive. Bhim and Arjuna wanted to kill. <laughs> now what to do? Shastra says for a for a kshatriya, uh, dishonor is worse than death. So then uh, Bhim and Arjuna they decided we will not kill Jayadrat because Draupadi is saying we should not kill him. But at the same time we will not let him go. We will insult him. So they decided to do a very special haircut. For, uh, for Chayatrat. Instead of having one shika, they made pancha shika. Shikas coming all over his hair from all directions. And they decided we will also do his mustache and, and beard. But not like the way they do in a, in a proper, uh, you know, gen salon or a hair salon in a, in a proper place. They did it very different. They said, we will take off his mustache and we will take off his beard, but we will take it only half. So from here, he didn't have a mustache. And from here, he had. So if you see him from here, you will think he has. But when you see him from here, he doesn't have a mustache. Similarly for the beard, he had it on one side and he didn't have it on the other. And they let him go like this. Imagine, how can Jayadrat face anyone? He has beard on one side, mustache on the other side, and hair all in pony cut and tied in different ways. Um, so he was really horribly insulted. <laughs> he took insult. Of course, for someone who's humble, there's no insult. But Jayadrat's false ego was completely, completely uh, plundered at this point. And he became so angry because better you just kill me, Jayadrat would have thought. Now you let me go and you insult me. I can't even show my face to anyone. I have to either take my beard and mustache off or I have to wait for it to grow for many, many days. That is quite insulting for a kshatriya. Um, so, so he was insulted like this. Now, Jayadrat thought, this is too much. I will now take revenge. Why are we saying this Katha from Mahabharat? Please attentively hear. Jayadrat became so angry that he did very hard austerities to please Lord Shiva. <laughs> because Lord Shiva is Ashutosh. <laughs> to please Lord Shiva, Jayadrat did uh, very severe austerities. And as he did austerities, very hard tapasyas, Lord Shiva appeared to Jayadrat. And he said, oh, Jayadrat, you can ask for a boon. Who's saying? Lord Shiva is saying to Jayadrat because Jayadrat was very sincere in his austerities. So Lord Shiva appeared. And uh, <laughs> he appeared. And Lord Shiva appeared and he told Jayadrat, you ask for a benediction. Jayadrat said, give me the boon that I can kill these pandas. Lord Shiva said, I can't give you that boon. I can't give you that boon. But I can give you the boon that in the battle, you can hold them at bay. You can control them for one whole day. This, this I can, benediction I can give you. You can hold them at bay, which means you can hold them for one whole day um, without, without being killed by them. This, this I can give you. You can, through your army and through your power, you can do this. Jayadrat said, yes, but uh, give me something more. If I can't kill the Pandavas, give me the benediction that they can kill me. They cannot kill me. I can't be killed by them. Lord Shiva said, yes, I can give you that benediction. If someone cuts your head, your head will become attached to the neck back again. This benediction I can give you. Then Lord Shiva added, but let me add a clause. <laughs> you want to kill the Pandavas? You can kill them. They want to kill you. They can kill you because if your head is cut, the head will be joined back again. But however, I'll add a clause here. You will die only if your father, O Jayadrat, your father throws your head down. Jayadrat said, my father will never throw my head down to the ground. He will never do that. Uh, so you can give that, no problem. Lord Shiva said, good, I will just add this clause. <laughs> Lord Shiva told Narada Muni, look, I have given boons to Asuras like Ravana and now given boons to people like Jayadrat who are fighting the devotees of the Lord. I am so... Uh, contaminated, Lord Shiva is speaking. Narad Muni, in return, he said, Oh, Lord Shiva, 
you are so humble. You are so humble. You're only finding faults in yourself. But I will tell you now a, 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 a counter argument to all these things that you have said. Whenever you give a boon, O Lord Shiva, it looks as if it's waterproof, which means there's no, no way to penetrate. But you always leave a loophole for some leak. <laughs> and he explained. In the battlefield of Kurukshetra, there was a plan of the Chakra Vyuha, which means uh, you trap Yudhishthir Maharaj in, in, a, in a wheel formation. Why trap Yudhishthir Maharaj? Because if you trap Yudhishthir Maharaj, uh, they know the battle will be over. They will win because Yudhishthir Maharaj is their leader of the camp. So if you capture and you kill him in a wheel formation in such a way that he can't escape that wheel military formation, it's called as the Chakra, View, Chakra Vyuha. Uh, if if uh, someone enters, uh, they have to fight everyone before they leave because it's a very strong, uh, complicated military formation. So they decided, uh, the Pandavas, uh, the Kauravas had decided on the battlefield of Kurukshetra to put Yudhishthir Maharaj through a chakra view. And in this way, the battle will end. They will win. There was only one person who knew how to counteract this chakra view. And that is Arjun. So Jayadrat, because he had the benediction from Lord Shiva that he could hold the Pandavas at bay for one whole day, Jayadrat decided that uh, I will fight Arjun. And because Arjun is the only person who knows how to break through a chakra view, I will hold Arjun to the side for one whole day. And the Kauravas can take Yudhishthir Maharaj in a chakra view. Huh? And they can kill Yudhishthir Maharaj and the, the, the battle will end. But however, this planning that the Kauravas had made, it backfired. This plan failed. Because there was, they thought there was only one person who knew about the chakra view. Huh? How to break the chakra view, huh? that is Arjun. But there was another person, another warrior on the other end, on the Pandava end, who knew something about the Chakra Vyuha. And that was Abhimanyu, the son of Arjun. He knew, but he knew only little. How is that? Actually, when Arjuna married Subhadra, and when she was pregnant with Abhimanyu in her womb, Arjun was speaking to Subhadra about Chakra Vyuha. <laughs> he was speaking about battle strategies. You know, men end up speaking to women things that are always there in their mind. <laughs> Not necessarily it may excite a woman or may interest a woman. The man will talk what is there in his mind. So Arjuna in his mind, what is there? Chakra Vyuha. So he's sitting and talking to Subhadra about the military formation, the complexity of a Chakra Vyuha. And naturally Subhadra, she's not interested. So she's listening and she dozed off. <laughs> but Abhimanyu in the womb was listening. So he listened till the point where Arjuna described how to enter the Chakra Vyuha. But as Arjuna was describing, he saw that Subhadra has dozed off to sleep. So he just disconnected the conversation there. So Arjuna, who was speaking about the Chakra Vyuha, had plans of speaking about how to enter and how to exit the Chakra Vyuha. But now because he saw that Subhadra had dozed off, he didn't speak about how to exit and break through that military formation. So Abhimanyu in the womb, this innocent, is everyone understanding and listening? So Abhimanyu in the womb, he had heard from Arjun on the formation of the Chakra Vyuha and how to enter a Chakra Vyuha. But unfortunately, he didn't know how to break out of a Chakra Vyuha. This is why I said he knew something about it, uh, but he didn't know um, the complete way to get out. So now as the Kauravas had planned, many Maharathis, they started... Uh, um, they started making the formation and they threw Yudhishthir Maharaj into the Chakra view. When this was happening and Jayadrat had held Arjun at bay because he had that benediction from Lord Shiva that he could do that. So Arjun is the only one who can break in and Yudhishthir Maharaj is in the Chakra view now. Now what happened? They didn't know Abhiman knew, knew how to break through. So the young, powerful, chivalrous Abhiman knew he actually broke through the Chakra Vyuha formation. But he didn't know how to exit. And many, many Maharathis, like Karana, like Duryodhan, like Dushasan, they broke Kshatriya moral etiquette of fighting. And they mercilessly, they killed the young Abhimanyu because he didn't know how to get out. He didn't know how to get out of the Chakra Vyuha. And it is because of Abhimanyu's sacrifice 
that he saved the entire war. Without him, Yudhishthir Maharaj would have been killed. The war would have been finished. The Kauravas would have won. So it was Abhimanyu who, um, who sacrificed, who, who entered the Chakra Vyuha, although he didn't know how to exit because he had heard from his father. And the Kauravas mercilessly started fighting and then um, the, the war which would have gone on the side as victory for the Kauravas was saved. At the end of the day, now what happened? Arjuna, he discovered that Abhimanyu, his son, had been killed. Arjuna felt very, very, very sad, betrayed, actually, how they could do to a 16-year-old child as Abhimanyu. He who knew how to enter a chakra view, how, would, how merciless they could be to kill him in the chakra view and not let him come out. So when Arjuna got to know that this is what Jayadra did, he helped me here so that my son could be murdered there, Arjuna took a vow that I will kill Jayadrat before the sun sets tomorrow. Or else I will jump on the fire, the, the pyre. I will collect wood, I will set it on fire and I will enter it. And I will kill myself. This vrat, this promise Arjuna had taken. Because it was Jayadrat who was the cause of... Uh, now Jayadrat had settled scores because he was caught by Arjun during uh, in, in Kamyavan that we described before when he was trying to kidnap Draupadi. So Jayadrat now settle scores by being the catalyst, by being the main agent for the killing of Arjuna's son, Abhimanyu. So now next day, it was the day when Arjuna had promised, before the sun sets, I will kill Jayadrat. The Kauravas were super smart in this regard, or crooked, we could say. What did they do? They made miles and miles of soldier armies, and then they put Jayadrat behind which means Arjun had to now fight through so many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of soldier, individual soldier armies. And then he will read Jayadrat. So it's possible that either he may not be able to win all over, over all of them and he, Arjuna may die. Or even if he wins over all of them, it'll be sundown because all they will go in just fighting these soldiers. And because Jayadrat has not even come face to face with Arjun by then, and Arjuna's word has gone... Uh, betrayed, or, or let's say it's, it's turned false, then Arjuna will have to kill himself. He has to jump into fire, right? The Kauravas made such sinister plan. Um, and guess what? Arjuna spent all day fighting all these soldiers one after another. And finally he reached Jayadrat. And when he was about to kill Jayadrat, there was a loud blowing of the conch shell. That the sun is down, the sun is setting, it's day over. Arjuna realized I had not fulfilled my vow that I, I will kill Jayadrat before the sun sets. So I must kill myself. Arjuna made a big pile of wood and uh, he climbed on top of it and he picked up an arrow to shoot at the, the, the pile of wood so that it can set on fire and he will burn. As Arjuna was preparing this pyre, of his departure, Jayadrat came there to instigate and ignite Arjun's anger. He started saying, wow, wonderful, Jai, how wonderful. You're going to burn in front of everyone. You're keeping your word. He started clapping. Suddenly at that time, there was sunshine. <laughs> there was bright sky and the sun was up there. Krishna had made a trick. Krishna used his Sudarshan Chakra to temporarily cover the sun so that it seems that it is sundown. So that Jayadrat will come face to face in front of Arjun. That because it's already sundown and Arjuna has lost his word. Jayadrat will come face to face. So when, that's exactly what happened. Krishna with the Sudarshan Chakra covered the sun. And Jayadrat came face to face in front of Arjun. Now Krishna told Arjun. It's still day. I covered the sun with my Sudarshan Chakra. So that everyone else thinks that it's end of the day. The sun is down. And Jayadrat will come face to face. Now I have taken the Sudarshan Chakra back. Actually, the sun is still up there. Kill him. So Jayadrat is face to face with Arjun. That same arrow that Arjuna had used to set the wood, uh, a pile of woods on fire, that same arrow Arjuna used to shoot at Jayadrat. Jayadrat was not celebrating anymore. <laughs> the arrow went straight. Uh, to cut off the head of Jayadra. Now, what actually happened is, Lord Shiva has given the benediction. If the head falls to the ground, then the head will come back. 
right? The head will get attached. So, uh, of course, Arjuna doesn't know about it. But it's inconceivable, really inconceivable how Lord Shiva worked in this regard. Arjuna shot the arrow, which went through the neck of Jayadrat and you know, took his head off. And at a distance, far away, there was Jayadrat's father. Jayadrat's father, now it was evening time, Jayadrat's father was offering oblation to the sun god. <laughs> he was offering his Sandhya prayers. He was offering water to Surya Dev. And he was having his eyes closed and he was Surya Ayanama, Bhaskar Ayanama, Aditya Ayanama. He was offering prayers to the, to the sun god. And he has had his eyes closed because he was just chanting mantras. Now this arrow of Arjun, which went through the neck of Jayadrat, took the head of Jayadrat in the palms of his father. And the father, as he's chanting and offering water, he didn't realize. He suddenly felt something very big fell into his hand and he opened his eyes and he just dropped it to the floor thinking, what is this? Without even realizing that it was actually the head of his own son. So Lord Shiva was instrumental in actually killing Jayadrat with this benediction that you will die only when your head is dropped by your father through his own palms. So in this way, uh, Narad Muni, uh, he describes to Lord Shiva that it seems as if you're giving boons to the demons, but you're always giving boons with loopholes in them so that they can be destroyed uh, and the devotees can win. That is how merciful you are, O oh Lord Shiva. Uh, Lord Shiva is very, very kind. Very, very, very kind. So much more can be said about Lord Shiva. But today is the day of Shivaratri. Today uh, is a very, very auspicious day. We, we offer our prayers. Uh, we offer our um, energy, our vocal capacity, our mental faculty in remembering the beautiful, wonderful pastimes of Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva is most powerful. Through Tattva Vichar, we saw that there are three names for Lord Shiva. And through Rasa Vichar, we saw how he is the best among devotees. He is always thinking himself to be the lowest. He is always so humble. And yet at the same time as Ashutosh, he's so compassionate. Even if demons come to him, he is giving them boons. But it seems he's taking sides with them. But through the story we saw, He's leaving a loophole. He's leaving a leak through which uh, the demons can be destroyed. And ultimately, the Supreme Lord and his devotees can win. Sometimes people even get bewildered when pastimes like uh, Lord Ramchandra worshipping um, Lord Shiva comes into picture. There are sections in the other sections in the other editions of Ramayana, like the Adhyatma Ramayana, etc. Even in Goswami Tulsidasji's Ramayana, there are sections where uh, just before crossing the ocean, Lord Ramachandra, he prays to Lord Shiva. And people get bewildered by this. They think that actually Lord Shiva is greater. But no, when the Supreme Lord Sri Ramachandra performs Naravat Leela, human-like pastimes, uh, he takes shelter of Lord Shiva. Because for the Supreme Lord, the devotees are greater than him. Yeme bhakta jana partha, name bhakta chate jana, bhakta naam cha ye bhakta. In the Adi Puran, Krishna has tell Arjun, told Arjun that those who worship my devotees, they are very dear to me. So Krishna himself, as Ramachandra, when he comes, he also worships the best among devotees as, as Lord Shiva. So when uh, Lord Ramachandra worshipped Lord Shiva, he called the linga as Rameshwar Mahadev. Rameshwar Mahadev. Rameshwar. So... The, the human beings around, all the res residents, different species, they said, Oh, Ramasya Ishwara Iti Rameshwara. Oh, Lord Shiva is the Ishwara of Ramachandra. So the demigods manifested. No, 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 no. Rameshwara means as worshipable is Ram, so worshipable is Ishwara, Lord Shiva. So the humans and other associates, when they saw Ram worshipping Lord Shiva, they said, Shiva is higher and Ram is uh, the devotee. But the demigods appeared and said, no, no, both are equal. Lord Shiva himself from the linga, he couldn't tolerate. So he came out. He said, no. Ramaha yasya ishwaraha sa. Which means I am Rameshwar, meaning he whose Ishwara master is Ram. So in this way, Lord Shiva reconciles that I am the devotee and Ramchandra is my Lord. So you can see sometimes the Supreme Lord does that. Even Krishna... Uh, after marrying Rukmini, when they wanted a son, Krishna and Rukmini, they worshipped Shiva and they got Pradyumna as the son. 
So this may bewilder Janasamanya people in general, but we can always see Lord Shiva very humble, giving shelter to even demons, even to ghosts who have no hope, drinking poison for the sake of mankind, coming down to serve as Adi Shankaracharya for the Lord, as Hanuman, he's ready to have his tail on fire, as Advaita Acharya, he's ready to invoke the Supreme Lord in this world, as Madhvacharya, he is ready to come with complete Shakti. And yet at the same time, as uh, Rudra, he's ready to destroy. As Shambhu, he's ready to create. And as Gopeshwar Mahadev, he's eternally sitting and chanting Japa with Ganga Devi on his head as the greatest Vaishnava. So in this way, Lord Shiva is uh, the, holding the highest pedestal of respect for, um, for all the Gaudiya Vaishnavas. The Gaudiya Vaishnavas are very dear to Lord Shiva. When Sanatan Goswami Pad was sitting and chanting Japa, Lord Shiva left Kailas and he came and settled down there just to hear the Japa of Sanatan Goswami at Govardhan. And that deity, even till this very day, is called Chakreshwar Mahadev. He who manifested at Chakratirtha, uh, just to hear the Japa of Sanatan Goswami. So in this way, just like the, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas or the Vaishnav community have uh, utmost respect and reverence for Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva himself, has utmost respect for all the devotees of the Lord. So in this way, on this most auspicious occasion of Shivaratri, we express our gratitude uh, to Shiva and Mother Parvati for turning our Bahirmukh face towards the lotus feet of Prajendranandan Shamasundar, Rasik Shekhar, Radha Raman Shri, Krishna. Tauru Pramanande, Hari Hari, Vancha Kalpat, Rupi, Tripasam, Rupi, Ayavacha, Patitanam Pavani, Pio Vaishnavi, Pio Namo Namaha. Hare Krishna, Tanavat, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Thank you so much. So beautiful section, class, Prabhu, very beautiful. So I'll not take much time. So Vinita Gandharvika, you can go forward. Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dandavat Pranam, what a beautiful class Prabhuji. Thank you so much for such a detailed class and at the end, nice pastimes. Thank you, thank you so much Prabhu. Uh, you have been speaking from one and a half hour. I was uh, thinking that, do you have time for questions or what do you think Prabhuji? I think today is the day of relishment. So we will not take questions today. <laughs> we, we have heard and meditated upon Lord Shiva. So we will keep our meditation going. Maybe at another time we can take some questions. No worries, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Very detailed class and uh, nice pastimes, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Very grateful to you. I would like to offer my obeisances to you and all. One minute, Mataji. Prabhuji, if you have just a one minute, if you can answer one thing, that there is a, some conflict, that Shivaratri is actually the marriage of Lord Shiva or Shivaratri is when Shiva drank Kalakuta. Only if this you can answer, with that we can end up. It is the marriage. It is the reunion of Mother Parvati and Lord Shiva. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there is, a, there, is, there is a long history to that. Uh, but <laughs> maybe, at, maybe at another time. <laughs> sure, 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 Prabhuji. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, Vinita Gandhavi Kamataji. Please go ahead. Thank you, Prabhuji, once again for such a beautiful class. We look forward again for your association. Um, we are eagerly waiting for the next class of yours, Prabhuji. So fortunate to hear on this special day. Um, glories of Lord Shiva from Hugh Prabhuji. Thank you so much. I would like to offer my obeisances to you and all the Vaishnavas assembled on the call. Vancha Kalpataro Biasya Kripa Sindhu Biyavaja Patidanam Pavane Biyo Vaishnavi Biyo Namo Nama Ananta Koti Vaishnav Rindhi Ki Jai Lord Shiva Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai His Grace Amarinda Prabhu Ki Jai Ananta Koti Gaur Bhakta Rindhi Ki Jai Vinita Gandharvika Mataji Ki Jai Amarinda Prabhu Ki Jai <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are closing. We'll meet again tomorrow for another Chaitanya Bhagavad class. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna.